And welcome back to a fresh episode of Business Growth Show. I'm your host, Sam Dunning, co-owner over at webchoiceuk.com. And if you haven't yet, check out my weekly emails where I share actionable B2B marketing, website and SEO tips, giveaways, goodies, free resources and more. Why not give it a trial over at businessgrowth.emails. Today, I'm joined by Andre Faji, Andrew's the uh, director of marketing over at PandaDoc. Andre, welcome Thanks. to the show. Hello, Hi. Sam. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm doing very well. No worries, man. Looking forward to digging into customer interviews. So we're going to be chatting today why you should run customer interviews and from a B2B perspective, how they're actually going to help you unlock insights, stories, and more to move the needle in a B2B perspective to drive pipeline and revenue so as we always do on the show let's dive straight into it um why should we be running b2b customer interviews andre well i would think that it would be a well understood universal practice that as a marketer we want to be very close to the people that we're trying to serve right our customer base and i remember a couple of years ago coming across this stat from profitwell that showed that in B2B marketing, 80% of marketers never talk to their customers, which I found appalling. Um, I, I didn't understand that you can actually be in this job and not really talk to the people that you are serving, right? So we have this abundance of data everywhere in our CRM. We have firmographic data. We have demographic data. We have psychographic data on our buyers. But if we're not talking to them, if we're not actively engaged in having meaningful conversations um, with the very people that fuel our business, I think it's a huge miss. So since then, I just kind of went on this path of trying to unpack why marketers don't talk to their customers more often in B2B. Um, mm. What are the low hanging fruit opportunities from from having those types of conversations and, you know, really learning from people outside of the B2B space who speak with individuals, whether it's B2C marketers, whether it's journalists or great interviews, interviewers throughout history who are just really good at having strong conversations that uncover incredible insights. I want to take those findings and then bring them into my craft as a marketer in the B2B space. Mm. Yeah. And why do you think some marketers or perhaps for smaller businesses, it might be founders, um, aren't running customer interviews? Do you think it's because things like perhaps they're, they don't realize that how beneficial they are? Or is it perhaps because they're maybe under pressure from their founders or management to kind of get get products, get offerings shipped out quickly? Or is it is it typically something else that you've seen? Well, I think in the very beginning of any business, you know, which is typically a founder with an idea, there are meaningful conversations that are happening with, with potential customers, right? That's where the early stages of trying to identify product market fit come into place. I think it's really as businesses scale, they just kind of assume that they already know everything that they need to know. And then they over-index on data um, that's basically collected, um, you know, so again, CRM data, like mm. that just validates a preconceived notion based on earlier research rather than, you know, really trying to go a layer deeper and understanding that, okay, maybe I have a good baseline set of information here. Now my job to build a great product and to have a great service and powerful marketing is to really go many, many, many layers deeper in understanding not just the solution, but you know the conditions around the problem that the customer is experiencing day in day out. Mm. And would you say if you're not running customer interviews, you're guessing as to things like you mentioned there, the problems you solve, perhaps the benefits you bring to the table, the value proposition of your offer, um, and various other things. I would say that you're you're maybe a degree of guessing. You're 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 operating on preconceived notions. Right. Um, and you're not really then challenging yourself or your team um, to go deeper and really understand, like, were these preconceived notions the right ones? You know, and again, as businesses scale, and I'm not just talking about the product element of the business, I'm also talking about the operational element of the business. Mm. You know, you bring more people into your team that adds more layers of complexity 
And how does that actually impact the experience the customer is receiving then? Because it's one thing when it's just one to one, but now the customer might be interacting with three, five, upwards of seven people with an organization. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, if it's okay with you, Andre, I think it'd be quite fun to perhaps do a scenario or a bit of a role play. So we could even do what you folks did at PandaDoc, um, whereby we start from the bottom up um, and we imagine that we haven't done any customer interviews yet. Um, so I want to get into the nitty gritty a little bit, which will hopefully provide some actual insights, tips and ideas to everyone watching or listening in, um, in terms of a few ideas, a few plays around conducting customer interviews. Um, so let's imagine perhaps we're an early stage company um, and perhaps we're running or we've decided that we need to run customer interviews to perhaps fuel our marketing. We realize that if we're not building out um, our product, our offer, our marketing materials, et cetera, for idle clients, then we know it's not going to resonate and hit home. What are some of the first things that we need to do before we actually run the interviews? I, I'm talking about things like perhaps line up X amount of customers, perhaps get this into play like what is the what is the step a before we do any actual practical things well step a is really kind of figuring out who should we be talking to in the first place right so um, i think a really easy and actionable first step is try to understand what segment of your customer base um, is really really happy with the product mm. or service right so start with essentially your most happy customers to understand why are they happy? Why have they been our customers or clients for over a year? Why did they renew their license, right? Why do I find that they're actually, uh, you know, kind of adopting features more quickly than, than others? Um, in Japanese, there's this word called okatsu, which is essentially um, used to kind of describe like super fans. Like uh, it's almost like hyper geeks, but not like in a negative way. It's like whether it's like coffee connoisseurs or, you know, record diggers, you know, these yep. are people who are just like, um, just fascinated and immersed in a specific thing, right? Try to find those within your customer base. And I'm sure everybody mm. kind of has some of those types of customers that just happen to respond to every email that comes in. Or again, when you want to beta test a new feature, they're the ones to, to, to quickly adopt it. Um, so I would start by identifying maybe 10 minimum of 10 upwards of 20 customers who fit that profile now don't worry too much about the demographics at this point or the firmographics because again you're looking at it from a different lens the lens that i think many of us probably have heard before which is the jobs to be done framework and and for people who don't know what jobs to be done really means is it's a um, it's a research framework that essentially says that all people hire products for a very specific job, right? Um, so what is that job that the customer is trying to get done, right? We're not necessarily buying a hammer uh, just to hit a nail into a board, right? We're trying to build a bed or we're, we're fixing something in our home, right? Um, try to understand the core job to be done. So that's why I don't, I mean, obviously, if you have some patterns within uh, firmographic data, it's interesting to look at that. But when it comes to having those initial customer research conversations, start yep. by identifying the power users. Gotcha. Gotcha. And if you're super early stage, perhaps you've got less than 10 customers or happy clients, or maybe you've got zero. Is this something you, in your opinion, you should wait until you've got that kind of sample size or should you perhaps reach out to network or prospects or what would you recommend in that situation if that was the case? That's interesting, right? Because, I mean, if you have zero customers, you probably don't have a business just yet, right? You have an idea. Um, so, I mean, I think the early stage, that's super, super early stage, you know, it's probably a little bit of a different mindset, but it still is more of a hypothesis at this point, which is like, I think that this is a problem that needs to be solved based on my own experience. And I think the early validation there is, can I find three people who would be willing to pay for that problem to be solved for them, right? Mm -hmm. So it still is a similar mindset around trying to uncover the job to be done. But at yep. the same time, you're still very, very early stage. You haven't even 
started really yet, right? So you want to just validate whether the idea is there's something really there or if it's worth revisiting or approaching from a different angle. Yeah, 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 it makes sense. Okay, so let's let's pretend we've got anywhere between 10 to 20 power users, happy customers, um, ready to, to interview. Like, what's, what's the next step? Because I know having those customers that are happy and then actually getting them to agree to run interviews is sometimes a bit of a different kettle of fish. It's not always the easiest thing to get people onto Zoom calls or video sessions or whatever that might be. Um, so what would be one of the next stages, Andre? So I think it's actually a little bit of a, a mis, misconception that customers, especially if they're happy customers, um, you know, are not willing to, to talk to us. Um, there was a survey done by Salesforce a couple of years ago that showed that many customers are actually incredibly excited. I think like 67% of customers they found were incredibly excited um, and willing to actually engage in a conversation with a vendor, um, give feedback if they felt like there was something of value that they were going to receive out of it. So I think the first insight when you try to um, craft a customer interview is like, what can what can the customer get out of this conversation? Mm. It's not just about me extracting value. It's about them receiving value as well. Yep. So, you know, some companies kind of go down the path of some type of monetary reward, whether it's a gift card or some type of incentive to have like, you know, um, you know, we're going to waive fees for the next month as a result, as our sign of appreciation, or we'll put you first in line to receive access to this new thing that we're building, Right. Again, these are your super users. So think about what might be an incentive for them. And others, you know, I mean, we've, I've definitely reached out to customers where I made it very well known that we think that you have an incredible story based on how long, you know, you've been a customer of ours. And we have a platform with X number of subscribers, X amount of reach, and we'd love to put you on our platform and share your story with our audience because we think they can learn from it. So we go more at Pandadoc from a content play where we, where we leverage our distribution and our reach as a, as a platform to put a spotlight on their stories and their businesses, right? So that's the first side of it um, is just matching the incentive um, and understanding their motivation. Then when it comes to actually crafting the conversation, this is really more about mindset um, because I wish I could tell you there was like a silver bullet question that like you just ask and you're going to get an amazing answer every single time. That's hardly ever the case, right? Um, so what you really need is an appropriate amount of time to have a meaningful conversation with this customer. I typically recommend, you know, aim for about an hour, even if the conversation only lands uh, 45 minutes, that's okay. But when you have an hour, uh, you have enough time to explore, um, you know, different areas of their job, their industry, the type of challenges that they experience, and you don't have to rush through it then, right? Um, we probably all heard from product uh, marketing, the five whys, like when somebody gives you a response, ask why, then ask why again, and ask why again. You want to give yourself space and the customer space to go deeper into things. So I might have a list of questions that I've crafted, maybe 25 questions, but the goal is not necessarily to get through all 25 questions, right? The goal is to extract as much value, maybe from three or five of those questions mm. and have something that's really insightful, whether I could use it for a piece of content marketing, whether it's, it's something that I could use for better messaging and positioning or something that I can pass back to the product team for potential product innovation. Yeah. So in terms of some good points, so in terms of the actual interview itself, and this is, I appreciate this is contextual and it's going to vary depending on the organization, but you mentioned a, a couple there. What should be your main, what should be the main outcomes that you seek as a result of this customer interview? I, are we going in with the mindset that we can then pull this and, edit and chop up the video clips for like customer success stories and then use those as testimonials, maybe ads and all that good stuff, put it on our website as a case study and more. Are we using it from a mindset we want to improve our product or our service and pull insights in that sense? Are we doing it for more customer success because we want to know how we can serve clients better or is it all three? Is it something else? <laughs> what have you found has been the best use cases? 
So as a marketer, where I have found the best use cases are really um, for maybe because it's my area of marketing, engagement marketing. So content, brand, top and middle of funnel, as well as, you know, even to an certain extent, some of the direct response stuff. I mean, I think it's the messaging, right? Um, I take the guesswork out of what is the voice of the customer by asking the best questions I can possibly ask in the context of that person's story. So I can only conceive so much in my mind as a marketer from a creative perspective. But oftentimes when I sit down with a customer, I'll hear things framed in a way that I never imagined, right? And then rather than trying to engineer that, I can just go ahead and leverage it, right? Because coming from their words versus my words, it's 10 times more powerful in the market. People know that, you know, um, every ad that they see from a brand, it's going to be a group of marketers behind it, right? So there's a little bit of that smokescreen objective lens. But when they hear people um, that can relate to their challenges, that can that actually speak in the language that they speak in within their industry or their job, it's 10 times more believable then, right? So it's about trying to extract that value in the most authentic way possible. And again, that requires me as a person who's conducting the interview to actually remove my own biases and agenda. You know, I have to remove all of that because they're the ones that technically should be in the spotlight. So two clear points for me are number one, my focus and my objective in that conversation is to extract as much as possible the conditions around the root problem, right? Okay. And what I mean by the conditions around the root problem, it's, it's not just the obvious thing around okay, I bought this piece of software because it solves for X in my in my day-to-day -day job. I want to kind of understand and maybe even um, agitate that problem. How big of a problem is it? What are the repercussions of this problem? What are the social and emotional detriments that come from experiencing this problem? Does it prohibit you from growing your career? Does it make your case to your boss that much harder for a promotion? Does it lead to a consistently poor customer experience for your customers. That's what I want to understand. That's the conditions around the problem. And then the other thing that I'm looking for in a story is, you know, how can we walk away from this where the customer is 10 times more interesting than the product? And that's again, where I think a lot of B2B marketing, especially in case studies and customer stories fails is it puts the product as the hero of the story, right? Like, you know, the, the product is the knight in shining armor that came in and solved all these problems for the customer. But when the customer is the hero of the story and you can understand the context of what they had to overcome, both mm. internally and externally within the organization to accomplish something, right? Mm. Um, now, your product is a tool, one of many, that enabled them to become that hero. So making the customer really the centerpiece and the hero of the story is another objective that I seek to get from these types of conversations. Nice. So, all right, two main out, two main kind of frameworks or outcomes we're going for: conditions around root problem and making the customer more interesting than your product, service, or offer, which I want to get into a bit more. In terms of problems, um, are we asking typical things, Andre, around kind of what was the main frustration or issue or problem you faced? Um, that motivated you to initially, I don't know, reach out to sales or whether it's an outbound deal, perhaps respond to our outbound call or outbound message and then digging in and agitating, kind of diving in there? Or do you like to take a slightly different approach? So that certainly is, um, you know, an approach that I've taken in the past and then tried to go deeper. But um, I typically like to start far before, in a conversation at least, I try to start before the catalyst event that tipped that customer customer over into searching for a solution and then inevitably becoming our customer, right? Yeah. Um, so we all know, right, the buyer's journey. Uh, and the buyer's journey is not a linear story, like A to B, B to C, C to D. Um, it typically starts long before a problem, right? Like, so understanding what their motivations within um, getting into that field were in the first place, right? You get a lot of great insights into the psychology behind um, their why, their why factor. Um, you can speak a little bit then more about 
the industry at large, because I think we as marketers uh, sometimes fail, not in sales. I see more salespeople, I think, taking a, a, a more keen approach and trying to understand the industry of their customers. But as marketers, we really need to understand the industry. If we're selling to finance people, to accountants, as an example, we need to understand their industry. We need to kind of understand what normal, what good and what bad looks like in their day to day. Right. Um, what are some of the macro themes and events that are impacting their work? You know, are they worried about AI or automation impacting their industry the way we're hearing a lot of talk about marketers being worried about what's impacting our industry? Right. So having even when they're unaware of a problem, trying to spend at least a few minutes of the of the interview, trying to just get that baseline contextual understanding. Right. And then, of course, along that path. At some point in time, they're going to talk about how their responsibilities increased, their role changed as a result. They had new responsibilities that then led them down a path of uncovering a new set of problems that they needed to identify a solution for. So the conversation still does move in the, in the context of a buyer's journey. But if you start right at the like, so tell me what happened that made you want to buy my product. You're missing so much amazing context about the backstory that led them to that point in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And is there like a limit you, you need to dig into um, these kind of things as to, I guess, not to piss the prospect or the customer off too much um, without constantly asking kind of, what made you decide to do this or what was going on when this happened or why why did it get so annoying that you finally decided to reach out to us and this kind of thing or is there like a gut feel moment where you feel you've got enough insights on this particular topic that you think yep yeah, we've got all the golden nuggets there let's move on to the next section of this interview yeah this this goes back into i think more of the art than the science i mean i think some people are really good at picking up on cues. You know, this morning I wrote about um, a very famous interview um, that I've learned a lot from, uh, an NPR interview from David Green, uh, his morning edition show where he interviewed Chrissy Hind, um, the lead singer of The Pretenders. And what was so famous about this interview is just how bad it was. And it's <laughs> not to say that, like, I mean, David Green is an incredible journalist with an, a very respectable career. He had a bad day, obviously, because there was a lot of things that he wanted to talk about in that conversation that were not aligned with what Chrissy Hind wanted to talk about. And she was in the beginning, if you listen to the interview, um, even though it's been dramatically edited, because I think there was so many uh, cuss words they had to take out of it. But um, if you listen to that interview in the beginning, she's saying, you know, more subtly, I don't really want to talk about that. Can we change the subject? But he was not picking up on those cues, right? So he kept pushing and pushing and pushing her to talk about things in her book that she didn't see the point in discussing. She said, I wrote about this for a reason so people could read it. I'm coming to this interview prepared to talk about other things, right? So I think just understanding, picking up on um, people's cues, right? Just yep. being a, a little, try to dial up your emotional intelligence in your mindset when you get into these conversations. Because if it starts feeling like an interrogation, question after question after question after question, you're going to really turn people off. Keep it conversational. Sure. You know, the first 10, 15 minutes of the interview should probably be very personable. I think, you know, in general, um, you know, my friends, my family in Europe is really good at this culturally and naturally, right? So, you, you have a business lunch and the first 45 minutes are just talking about life and family and kids and values and, you know, where you traveled and all these things. And the last 15 minutes is bra brass tacks. You get into the nitty gritty, right? I think there's something we can learn from that, that type of ethos when we're engaged in an in a, in a interview with our customers, that there is another human being on the other side of this conversation, right? And they might have woke up and had a bad day. They might have something going on in their life that is incredibly stressful. So just being emotionally intelligent and sensitive to that. Yes, you still want to extract value, but also keep that in mind in the conversation. Yeah, 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 makes sense. Let's move on to the second half and um, making the customer more interesting than the offer. Can you share a bit more about how that works and how we should take an approach to that aspect of the interview? Yeah. So um, like we said earlier, right, like a lot of a lot of customer stories are, um, you know, Sam had this problem. 
Sam found Pandadoc. Sam no longer has this problem anymore. Pandadoc is awesome, right? That's, that's just a general script that we find in like 95% of customer stories out there. And I think what would be more interesting is to kind of understand what else is going on in Sam's life. Like for you to start this podcast, for you to start your business, at some point in time, you had to take a bet on yourself. You had to take some type of risk. You might have come from a place where, um, you know, you had something really stable and you wanted to break free and do your own thing, right? And there was conditions around that motivation, whether it was you were inspired by other people in the space, you found that there was a lack of certain type of content within this industry and you felt uniquely motivated, maybe qualified, or maybe not even qualified, but definitely motivated to take that Definitely not the latter. (laughs) And that to me is the beginning of a really interesting story. Did you have other people in your life, whether it's personally or professionally that helped cheer you on? Or did you have people in your life that maybe told you, you know what, Sam, I think you're a great guy, but uh, I don't think you should do this. You should stick with your gay job. That's the real story here. So now it's not just Sam is using Pandadoc, Pandadoc's awesome. Sam can streamline his entire proposal and contract workflow with Pandadoc. It's You've now built um, a really impressive audience. You've built a personal brand. You've built a business and you've overcome incredible things along the way. Now, one of the tools that you happen to use is Pandadoc, right? So that's really cool because the product is associated now with a hero. And I think all marketers should think about how can I associate my product with a hero? And there's a lot of heroes out there, you know, what's that expression? Not all heroes wear capes, but there's a lot of heroes out there who do incredible things and they deserve to have a microphone to share their stories. Mm. Nice. Nice. So, no, I mean, those have given some, some great examples of questions and we can kind of take a lot of ideas. Like you say, each, each one's going to be a bit different. So I'm guessing it's one of those things, probably Andre, that when you do the first couple, it's pretty nerve wracking you've probably got a list of questions that you're proposing and it might go a bit off tangent. And I'm guessing the more and more you run these things, the more you warm into it. A little bit like running a podcast interview, the more and more comfortable you get and the more you kind of pick up on body language, different cues, when to dive deeper, when not, what questions to ask, how to dig for pain, how to make it into more of a conversation than interrogation and and kind of weaving things into a story. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just... For the record, I mean, I have botched so many interviews and and I still walk away from certain conversations where I felt like this wasn't what I hoped for it to be. And I could even sometimes feel when the person I interviewed felt that way, too. So I don't want to make it seem like, um, you know, anybody has like this superpower where every interview. I mean, hey, if if David Green can botch an interview, who am I? Right. Of course I will. Right. So I think it's, again, it's more about the mindset. And, and I genuinely think that it's helpful to try to approach these interviews from the perspective of a journalist, to understand that there's two sides or more to every story. Um, there's so many conditions and variables that impact human beings and lead them down a certain path. And they become a whole lot more interesting when you understand those nuances. So. Mm. It's okay to walk away from certain conversations and feel like, um, you know, there's that probably wasn't the very best interview you've ever had. Um, As long as you can walk away still learning something for the next one, it's a valuable use of your at least your time in that in that in that instance. Um, But yeah, over time, you know, the more of these you have. And this is why I actually uh, talked about this last week with somebody. It's like, you know, try to cluster these interviews. Don't just like sprinkle them like one here and then in three weeks, another one there. Try to cluster. If you can only start with three, start with three, right? But try to cluster them so you stay in the same mindset. So, you know, if you cluster them in a day or two, now you have uh, a mental framework and pattern recognition that you can identify and you can learn from the previous conversation to get into the next one, right? If you Mm -hmm. leave too much time in between, you might miss some of those subtle insights that could have been really helpful to take on in a conversation. Um, Because again, you know, due to the amount of time that went by, you just forgot about it. So also record it, right? If you can't, from a scheduling perspective, cluster the interviews, record it, 
and re-listen to that conversation. It's going to be really awkward and painful. You're probably going to want to just mute yourself and turn off the screen when you see yourself talking. But it's really helpful to have that feedback loop because then you can say, how am I approaching this individual? Am I making, am I doing my best to make them comfortable? Am I being personable? Do I sound overly scripted? So, you know, I mean, that's why all great performers, whether it's comedians, musicians, they're always reviewing, you know, their own work. Um, And we're we're our own worst critics. So we're going to kind of look at it through that lens, but it's going to help us do better at the next one, at the next opportunity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And can definitely resonate with, with some of those points, especially trying to batch them or do do them fairly close together because so i was just saying before we hit record i've just been in greece for a couple of weeks and it feels like i haven't done a podcast in about a year so it's it's nice if you can like you say not only is it does it make you more consistent you learn from each one you improve your your conversation or your interview skills get comfortable in front of camera and the microphone talking to people so it's all it's all a win-win um and you'll steadily steadily make that progress so yeah like all of that in terms of so let's say we've done our, we've run our interviews. We've interviewed um, our ten to twenty happy clients. How are we now pulling the information that we need, the insights, the stories, and perhaps more? So I guess there's a couple of things to this. First and foremost, after the recordings, like what are we looking to to do now? What is the next step now? We've actually got these stored in I don't know Google Drive somewhere. Yeah. So you have your you have your stories, you have your interviews, you start reviewing all of the qualitative research, right? And what you're really looking for, especially if you're looking to kind of inform your messaging, your positioning is a pattern for desired outcomes around certain pains, right? So, you know, if you're if you're focused, if your ICP is, um, you know, account executives or sales leaders and companies that have 500 to 1,000 employees, what are the consistent pains that you're hearing from the people that you interviewed and what are their desired outcomes, right? So that really helps make your messaging and positioning a lot more crisp and detailed. And again, you're using the voice of the customer there. The other thing is, again, because you've taken the time from a content perspective, let's say content marketing, you've taken the time to kind of understand their industry, the common themes and pains. From there, you can also start crafting really great top of the funnel content, right? Because these are the things that are keeping CFOs up at night or VP of sales up at night, right? So now it's not just your own assumptions. You're hearing it definitely from your own customer base, the types of things that they're thinking about, the type of trends um, or changes in their ever-evolving industries. Again, that makes for great top of funnel content, not necessarily from a thought leadership perspective, maybe just because I don't like the word thought leadership, but it's more about like, what is your point of view on the industry? right? Yep. Um, what is your unique stance, right? And again, you can probably hear from the voice of the customer exactly, you know, what their approaches are. Some of them might not even involve using your product or your solution to solving some of these problems. That's okay. You still want to understand the macro. But then again, the more you understand what's happening contextually in the industry, and then what are the catalyst events that led them to start searching for a product or solution within your category, then you understand from a desired outcomes perspective, what are the key themes here that I need to focus on in my middle of funnel messaging, right? What are the common objections? What are the considerations around pricing or buying committee or onboarding that I hear as a reoccurring theme within the Mm. consideration set of my customers, right? And then finally, what was a thing that led them over to being able to make that purchase? You know, whether it was a specific offer, whether it was timing, whether it was consensus within a particular stakeholder and that their organization, those are the things then that from the middle of the funnel or to the bottom of the funnel outside of, of course, a great, uh, a great product and a great customer experience are going to be um, vital in helping craft really strong offers, really strong case studies, powerful customer stories, right? Mm. So there's a lot you can uncover from these conversations as a marketer. Again, 80% of marketers never talk to their customers. So you just by being one, even if you fumble your way through that conversation, you're already doing something that the majority 
of your peers and most likely competitors are not doing within your category. So I think there's a lot then to be taken from those conversations that could be incredibly actionable to just, again, make your messaging, positioning, content, and offers that much stronger. Awesome. Another, th another thing that I'll add, and this is probably for a whole other conversation, um, think about the customer experience because there's so many hoops that we make our customers jump through when they're ready to buy our product or solution, right? Fill out this form, wait 48 hours to get on a conversation with somebody. That first conversation, they're just going to qualify you. You're like, well, I already qualified myself and I'm raising my hand saying I want to buy this product. Now you got to talk to somebody else, right? From these customer interviews, you get a lot of insights around the operational organizational attitude that B2B companies have towards their customers, specifically the ones who are hand raisers. And you'll probably walk away feeling very disappointed. That's a perfectly normal feeling because you realize like, man, we're really making you jump through all those hoops, right? I mean, in a previous organization, I remember doing customer research and talking to people who said, yeah, I had to fill out three different forms before somebody contacted me. That was, that was a harsh thing to hear. It made me feel very embarrassed, right? So I think a lot of these insights outside of the marketing lens could really help you as an organization develop more empathy for your customers and do mm. better in all the touch points that they experience. Again, from you know sales to onboarding, onboarding to customer success. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the advantage of this, it sounds is almost endless because not only can you take the insights from what your customers are saying around problems, pain points they had, impact of pain, what was the root cause, what was the catalyst that made them decide to take action, um, and why did they choose you? Perhaps they're comparing vendors, like what was the points of differentiation, differentiation, et cetera, all of which you can leverage in testimonial videos, messaging, ad copy, website headlines, product page details, and more. But also, you, the points, like you say, you can actually leverage to improve your own marketing. So whether that is your website, like you mentioned there, perhaps uh, the customer is really happy that they're using you now, but at the time of sign up, they had to fill out a demo form and like you say, get qualified by an SDR, 48 hours get later, get a demo from an AE, then maybe wait more, more, more time to get a more detailed product run through and then eventually was able to, to sign up once they knew pricing and specs and all that good stuff, get the team on board and, and sign up to your offer. So actually, I guess understanding what is hamstringing your company in terms of actually a, a flow for onboarding clients um, or onboarding kind of high intent prospects that are ready to talk to sales and making that process more easy for them and more enjoyable. Um, but I suppose there's, there's so many more elements to it as well that they could then impact things like the actual product or offer itself because um, they can give you insights into what they feel is working well and what's not. So like I say, it's almost endless the amount of insights that you actually collect from these things because I suppose I suppose you can actually interview customers multiple times as well. I suppose you could do one like once they've been on board with you for a few months, then perhaps they've been on board with you for three years and you do it again. Absolutely. And as new customers come into your user base, you know, you're going to get a fresh perspective, right? Mm. Um you know, again, I think the, the benefit to making customer experience of value within your organization is it's, a, it's an opportunity as you scale to stress test your systems, to stress test your process. You know, I mean, there's things that when we did uh, a secret shopper um, initiative here at, at Pandadoc, which is essentially is what it sounds like, we literally had somebody walk through um, the entire customer journey and purchase our product, right? Um, so what we learned were opportunities to improve even how our systems were talking to each other, right? Like sometimes, you know, how through data collection, you have a lead being, um, you know, sort of routed in a certain place, their information being stored in your CRM, then you start having the automations work into play. But Every time they, or not every time, but when they convert to becoming a paying customer, what happens to those marketing automations? You know, sometimes the systems might not actually update. So they're still getting certain emails that are not appropriate because they're pre-sales yep. emails while then also getting customer emails, 
we uncovered some of those insights said, wow, there's so much room for improvement here, right? So even just in terms of like validating stress testing as you scale, you know, mm. are your systems doing the things that they're designed to do, which is to be sending relevant communication and information to both buyers and customers alike. Here's a tricky one. When you're gathering these insights, especially when it comes to actually changing key messaging points, i.e. homepage headline, um, major ad headlines, and similar, how do you know when you've got enough insights that this messaging is then going to resonate? I know you can never say 100%, but when you're pretty confident, pretty damn confident it's going to hit home with prospects and they're going to think, yes, that's my pain point. Yes, that's where I want to get to. Yes, that's worthy of going on a landing page or a home page or one of our key ads or one of our key testimonial videos and, and so on. So um, I'm going to give you two answers. I'm going to give you kind of like an obvious low hanging fruit answer. And then I'm going to give you a little bit of like a cheat code answer. Um, and the cheat code's a little bit of a plug, but I don't think they'll mind me plugging them. So the obvious answer is, you know, you've, you've done, let's just say, 10 interviews, 15 interviews, you, 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 now you've gathered the, the research that you need to, you know, uh, craft more compelling messaging. You know, I think what a lot of marketers will do is they'll find ways to, you know, generate some ad copy with that polished messaging and look for like an uptick in conversions or engagement, depending on the stage of the funnel. Right. So that's, that's one obvious answer. Second obvious answer is, go back to the same people that you interviewed and put, put it in front of them, right? And, and, and get their feedback. Say, hey, based on what I heard from you, this is how we're positioning the problem. Does this resonate? Does this make sense, right? Now, where the shortcomings in that approach um, happen is everybody has bias. And especially if they've already converted into paying customers, the chances are that they've made up their mind already that like you, your solution, your product is the right fit for them. So you can't really remove that bias from them. The next best thing to do, which goes into the cheat code mode is put it in front of an audience that matches your ICP, but they're not existing customers. Mm. And um, what we use is a tool called winter spelled W Y N T E R.com. It's a message testing platform. So we run, whether it comes from like landing pages or home pages, we actually select um, uh, a group of B2B, uh, you know, individuals that matches our ICP and we'll put our messaging in front of them. And we get their uh, a whole ton of amazing insights from clarity scores to resonance to areas of improvement. So um, that gives us the ability when we actually launch something in the market to have with like a very high degree of confidence, some, some you know, this, um, this understanding that the, the message we crafted is going to be compelling to our target audience. Mm. I like it. I like it. I need to get Peep on this podcast. He's, he runs Winter. And uh, yes. I remember he used to do a series on LinkedIn called Do You Even Resonate? where he'd review like uh, B2B SaaS uh, home pages or just B2B company home pages and landing pages and then just tear them apart based on customer feedback and ICP feedback. So totally, yeah, I, I like that approach for sure. Because then like yeah. you say, going in with that bias of customers that already are well, preaching to the converted, let's say you're going into cold audiences that fit that target market you're after, but getting the cold hard, hard truth. <laughs> exactly. And that's what we need to keep us honest. For sure. For sure. Um, Andre, anything else that we should consider before we wrap things up when running these that we perhaps haven't yet gone into? Again, I think it comes down to more of a mindset um, than anything else. I know, I know it's right now very much on trend as, as marketers to look for you know, uh, the, the silver bullet, right? The, the, the 10 bulletproof questions that you're going to be able to ask to get amazing insights and like we talked about before we even hit the record button, if I said something like that, it would be disingenuous because I don't have it. You know, I have found that certain approaches, certain questions can lead to incredible insights from certain people I've interviewed while the same exact questions when I tried them in a different person didn't really go anywhere. Right. So I think, you know, just having that type of journalist mindset that, you know, I'm here to uncover the truth and I'm, I'm kind of removing my own bias, my my own agenda as much as possible, 
you know, um, from this conversation. Because at the end of the day, like I said, you know, the people that you're interviewing, you'll be surprised how many incredible stories there really are. Um, that's the thing that, at least for me, my conviction in marketing is, is really about uncovering those incredible stories that our customers have. And it makes you then feel like, wow, I'm actually part of something bigger here because it's not just a product. It's a tool that's enabling this person to do almost Herculean things. So you develop that empathy, whether it's like, in my case, I've talked to, you know, um, customers who work in assisted living and hospice, you know, these are really emotionally challenging industries and environments to not just from a bureaucratic perspective, but from an emotional perspective, right? So when I hear these types of stories and then I apply it to the way they're using our product, mm. it just makes us, me feel like, wow, we're actually in, in, our, in our own small ways doing something a little bit more significant than selling a widget. So that's my takeaway from all that. Love it. Andre, thanks very much. Really appreciate you coming on the show, sharing your thoughts around all things customer interviews and your insights, ideas, and more. Much appreciated, sir. So with that, please do tell us more about how everyone tuning in can learn more about yourself, PandaDoc, and anything you want to share with the audience. Absolutely. Um, look, I just have a humble following on on LinkedIn. Um, I am truly just trying to share my point of view on making marketing a little bit more human. So if you're interested in following along as I try to figure this stuff out and ask people way smarter than me um, for insights, uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn. And I look forward to connecting with you. Nice one, Andre. And we'll put all of those links in the show notes to your LinkedIn over at businessgrowth.marketing. And I want to thank you once again for coming on. Really enjoyed the chat. Thank you very much, Sam. I appreciate the time. No worries, man. And as always, if you enjoyed today's episode, a quick rating or review on your podcast channel is appreciated. Or if you're on YouTube, a subscribe goes a long way. And with that, we'll catch you on the next one for more no BS, actionable B2B marketing tips to grow your business, grow your revenue. We'll catch you soon.